Welcome everyone. So we're going to get started in just a moment here. We're going to give people another minute to uh, join us and then we will get started. Okay, um, so we are about two minutes past the hour. So I think it, it'll be good to at least do the introduction. Um, that'll take a few minutes anyway, and anyone uh, else can jump in then afterwards. Uh, they will uh, be able to catch up later on, uh, maybe during the Gather Town session of, uh, of this social today. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen for uh, you all that are just meeting us for the first time. Okay, uh, so my name is Laura Montoya. I'm one of the founders of uh, Excel AI Institute and the Latinx AI organization. Um, we are very excited for you to be here with us today for day two of our social at NACL. Um, we have, of course, some wonderful keynotes and uh, discussion session lined up for us, uh, for you guys to participate in. And uh, before we do that, we wanted to give a brief introduction to the organization for anyone who is just joining us for the first time. Uh, and is not familiar with our organization or our programs or our platform. And then of course, we will give you the opportunity to ask some questions later on about that uh, during the roundtable sessions. Um, but then also uh, we wanted to introduce our wonderful keynote speakers today and then uh, have you listen to their uh, really great talks. So um, this is the Latinx and AI organization. Um, the goal of our organization is to build a community of Latinx professionals working within artificial intelligence, machine learning, neuroscience, data science, and so on. Uh, and our organization is really global. So we have members from all over the world, the US, Central and South America, and even uh, Latin American identifying individuals who live uh, in Europe and Asia and so on. So um, for us, we are really grateful to have such a large community and, and wonderful group of people that have come together uh, to create this space uh, for one another. So. Our mission is to bridge communities, academics, industry, and politician working to further AI innovation and resources for Latinx individuals. And so we do that by uh, driving and supporting research, development, infrastructure, and mentoring programs that really boost innovation and the capabilities of our members uh, that are working in the AI machine learning and data science space. Uh, this organization was started back in 2018 um, from, for people that are working in all areas of AI, including education, research, engineering, social impact, and so on. And the goal of our organization was to create opportunity for Latinx and AI members. Um, we did that, of course, through many different ways. We started out in San Francisco. We launched with uh, just a town hall meeting uh, just to see what the community there wanted and needed in the space and then have uh, broadened from there. For us, uh, one of the major ways that we have provided uh, this space and this impact is through our uh, members directory and through our um, app forum. So if you're not familiar with that yet, uh, and if or if you have been familiar with that and you were with us from the beginning, you might know that originally that started out as just like a, a Google spreadsheet that we kept online of people that were uh, working in the space that signed up to you know, opt in to have their information shared publicly. We have since uh, launched the app, uh, which is uh, really wonderful. And it is a space for um, others to find each other, right? To collaborate for research opportunities, for speaking opportunities and so on. So if you're not familiar with it, we would say, um, please do go ahead and sign up. It's free to join. And then also if you're an ally, you're welcome to join as well. And so when you first sign up, you will get access to our forum here. We will post all of our events, job opportunities and uh, other types of opportunities here. You can uh, you know, share your own posts here. You can uh, look at the forum. You can get your own notifications, look through our members directory send direct messages to different members uh, and invite others to join as well. So, you know, there's a lot of different options to participate. And of course we will be adding more features as time goes on to this particular app. Uh, it's currently web-based. Uh, we will be sending out an iOS and Android version that's native um, shortly as well so that it integrates a little bit more with your mobile devices. Um, but of course this is a starting point for us in the organization. Um, alternatively, uh, we have these research workshops, which we have been running since the beginning. Our first one, of course, at the Neural Information Processing Systems Conference back in 2018. Um, and the goal of these research workshops is, again, to, like this social, provide a platform for our members to really share their work. 
Uh, the, the good thing about it is it gives you an opportunity to submit your work and actually have it peer reviewed. And then of course published in the, alongside this official conference and have it um, take part in the proceedings and everything for that official conference as well, which gives you the opportunity to really share your work at, on a global level in a way that a lot of Latin American individuals had not had the opportunity to do so previously. So we started out at NeurIPS and then from there started hosting official workshops at ICML. We are now also hosting at CVPR and ICCV. And of course, now we're hosting socials at many other conferences, including AAAI, uh, NACL, EMNLP, and so on. And, and we look to just expand this uh, moving forward into the future. And of course, with uh, hosting at these conferences, um, we have raised what uh, we call a travel grant fund where we do actually sponsor members of our community, both for registration as well as uh, travel and accommodations. And then of course, per diem, uh, for them to be able to participate in these conferences, we understand that oftentimes the cost to attending and you know to take the time off work and so on uh, can be very high from people from different uh, backgrounds and, and locations around the world. So we wanna ensure that we are providing that for our members. Uh, another program that was launched um, early last year was our mentoring program. So this was launched by uh, several members of our community. And basically the goal is to provide mentorship opportunities for those who are early career and even some mid-career individuals who you know, would like additional support as they move on to the next phase um, of their uh, you know, particular search and, and development. So um, the, basically what you do to join this mentorship program is just fill out a basic form, either as a mentor or a mentee. And you talk about what your particular interests, specializations are, what your goals are. And then from there, you are matched uh, with a mentor or mentee. You conduct a virtual mentoring over a three month period that coincides with our workshop. So uh, for example, if you're into computer vision, it would coincide with CVPR. If you're into more uh, general AI um, or machine learning, deep learning and so on, it might coincide with ICML or NeurIPS. And then you just connect with your mentor um, once for uh, three month, once a month for a three month period uh, over a video call such as this, or uh, you can also communicate via email and Slack and so on. Um, of course, the goal is to improve your outcomes and to incorporate your mentor feedback. And of course, prepare a very effective presentation if you're going to be presenting in one of our workshops or maybe publishing in a journal and so on. Uh, and then of course uh, you can go into the, the publication or um, the conference with ease and, and really feel uh, confident about uh, the work that you are bringing to the table. So that is the goal of this particular mentoring program. Some have also signed up if they are trying to uh, apply for a new job or maybe a PhD program or a postdoc program. So uh, really our mentors provide many different ways uh, of you know, offering support. It's not just particularly for uh, presenting at conferences. So keep that in mind if you would like to participate and of course, we would like to thank um, our corporate partners because they make this work possible, especially with our travel grant fund. Um, so those annual uh, sponsors and partners of ours include uh, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, NVIDIA, and Salesforce. And of course, there are um, several others who do sponsor individual workshops or events uh, that are not our annual sponsors, and we appreciate all of them for their support. Um, so with that, I am going to switch over to today's event. Uh, so this is, of course, the Latinx AI social at NACL. And this is day two of our session. And so with day two, we are going to kick off uh, with two keynotes. We have uh, Deborah uh, Fieria. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and then also Diego Musalem. Um, and, uh, you know, after that, we are going to be following up with a uh, Q&A session for each keynote, and then we're going to switch over to Gather Town uh, so that we have some uh, opportunity for open discussion and to get to know each other a little bit better uh, for this particular conference. So um, I would like to take a moment to have our social chairs uh, do a quick introduction to them as well so you get to know them and, of course, to thank them uh, for all of their effort in putting together this particular event. Um, let's go ahead and get started with uh, Diana. Do you want to uh, say a few words? Sure. Thank you, Laura. So, well, my name is Diana Galvan. I am Mexican, and I am curr currently affiliated to the Riken AIP Center in Japan. So, well, I've been involved in these events since I think like uh, it's going to be almost a year since we first started with this. And yeah, I'm really happy to, to be here with, with you guys. And I hope that you enjoy the event. Thank you, Diana. Okay, and then uh, Thiago, do you wanna say hi to everyone? 
Hello, everyone. My name is Thiago. I'm uh, originally from Brazil. Uh, uh, my interest is in terms of in research is like natural language processing, specifically in natural language generation and question answering. Nowadays, I'm a postdoc at Federal University of Minas Gerais, that is in the state I state in Brazil. And also last week, I started as a an apply engineer for natural language processing in AI Explain, a startup. And that's me. Uh, feel free to, to contact me if you if you would like to, to connect to talk about research and uh, about the Latinx community. I'm happy to, to be here to, to straight the bonds between the community. Thank you, Thiago. Okay, and then uh, do we have Martin with us? Yep. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Villalba. I come originally from Argentina, but I'm currently working in Germany. I studied compu uh, computational linguistics in Saarland University, and yeah, I am currently working mostly on text classification for industry. And it's great to have you all here, and it's great to be here. Thank you, Martin. And then is Ivan with us today? No, I don't think so. Okay, uh, so maybe you'll get an opportunity to meet Ivan at another session. He has been a workshop chair as well uh, as a social chair with us. So I'm sure he'll uh, you know, be around maybe at the um, uh, open discussion section. Uh, but, and then uh, I think I saw Rosana on the call. Do you wanna say hi, Rosana? Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Rosana. I'm from Brazil and I'm a PhD candidate at the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil. And I'll work at, uh, as a researcher at the laboratory for experimentation translation. Uh, my main interests are on natural language generation uh, and text simplification. Well, I entered uh, Latinx, Latinx AI uh, this in this uh, social events. I was also an organizer at the WinOP uh, workshop. So uh, if you want to talk about uh, promoting more diversity in NLP, uh, please connect and have a great uh, event today. Thank you, Rosana. And then um, Maria Luisa Santiago goes by Lois. Lois, do you want to say hi to everyone? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Maria Luis Santiago. So I'm the logistics and uh, uh, operations and logistics coordinator for LXAI and Axel AI. So um, if anyone of you wants to uh, get in touch with the organization, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you, Lois. Okay, great. And then um, you guys have had a brief introduction to me as well. Um, just uh, for more background, uh, my family is from Colombia and uh, I was born and raised in the US, but uh, obviously uh, my heritage is very important to me. So that's part of why I started the organization and I'm very happy uh, to be here and doing this work uh, in the space. So um, let's go ahead and introduce our first speaker. So um, maybe I think Diana is going to do an introduction for Deborah. Yes. So today we have Deborah Pereira. I also, sorry, in Spanish, probably I um, pronounce your, your last name a little bit stronger. So she's a PhD student in computer science from the University of Manchester. And well, she's from Brazil. She is from the Universidad de Brasilia. And she's currently studying like a, an over, in, studying the overlap between natural language and mathematical language and how semantics of these two types of this course can be represented together in different applications. So her talk today, I think is going to be related to that. So we're going to learn a little bit more about her, her research. So welcome Deborah and thank you for being here. So thanks for introducing me, Diana. And thank you very much for having me today. It's really special to be here for me. Uh, so today I'll be talking a little bit about how can we, how can we apply NLP models to, uh, to mathematical text and what challenges are there and what I have been doing to push this research, uh, the, the narrative a little bit further. 
So my name is uh, Debra Ferreira, <laughs> and it's a quite common last name in, in Brazil because we have Tiago here, who's also Ferreira, but uh, we, we are not related at all. <laughs> So as, as Diana said, I'm from Brasilia, Brazil, this beautiful city pictured there. And I'm almost at the end of my PhD. So I'm just uh, doing things to try to get everything together and finish it up. So first I would like to start by sharing my vision of what I would like the field to look, this field of AI and mathematics together, uh, how I would like this to look like in medium long term. And this is what I've been pushing uh, the narrative towards. So I think one thing we can all agree on is that mathematics, mathematics is extremely important for science. So mathematics is a part of the, the scientific argument for a lot of areas. Even if you think about uh, humanities, mathematics is still there when we're doing some quantitative analysis, statistical analysis. So it's quite important for science. There is also uh, some research that says that there's a correlation between learning maths and developing certain cognitive abilities. So for example, uh, it's especially parts of the brain that are responsible for problem, sol problem solving skills and reasoning skills. And this actually makes me really worried about my country because we are, Brazil, unfortunately, is one of the worst countries in terms of uh, scores in mathematics. But hopefully my research can help change uh, that a little bit. There is also a lot of data, mathematical data to be processed. So every year, at least a quarter of theorems are proven. And if you think about all this machine learning papers that are just published every day and the amount of mathematics that it contains. Just imagine the amount of mathematics that is being produced every day. So we have the data and we have the need for mathematics. So my vision is, can we create some kind of NLP model, AI model that can help us understand better and use mathematics better. So is it possible that we can create this model that will uh, teach us how to, uh, uh, how to teach mathematics better according to each person's specific needs? Uh, can we also at some point get, uh, use this model to make new scientific discoveries? even in different areas such as physics, chemistry, all different areas that use some kind of mathematics. So of course, that's the general dream, but being a bit more uh, pra pragmatic about it. Maybe we can start by addressing some specific points. So for example, imagine I have a, a theorem that I'm trying to find the proof for. So if I have a model that can uh, uh, recommend me, for example, a theorem that might be useful, or you can say, oh, the proof uh, might have this certain structure. So this, this might be a starting point. And if you think about uh, all these points that, uh, that I address here, they have been uh, explored in NLP uh, at, some, uh, at some point. So for example, if you think about uh, this theorem might be useful for you, this is very similar to information retrieval. This is very similar to recommender systems. If you think about a system that can say, this equation can be solved like this, or the proof for that is going to have this structure. This is very similar to language generation or explanation regeneration, or even uh, trying to find the type of proper or properties of a specific variable. Uh, this is very similar to coreference resolution or uh, relation extraction. So, it's not too far-fetched to imagine that all these uh, properties might, uh, all, all these, these problems might uh, be addressed using NLP models. Some people, uh, when I talk about AI combined with mathematics, they ask me, okay, uh, are you talking about taking a, a statement in natural language and then converting it to some type of formal language and then doing some automatic verification on top of that. 
That is a, a way to do it. There is a lot of research going on in formal methods towards uh, that direction. But this conversion from natural language to formal language is not trivial at all. So here I have two uh, examples of different proofs, which is proving exactly the same thing. So it's, trying to pr uh, it's proving the theorem that there are infinitely many primes. For every number n, there exists a prime p larger than n. So both cases, it's uh, proving exactly the same thing. But the one on the left is the type we usually see, the type of proof that you usually see in a scientific paper or a, mathem or a mathematics book. So it's the type of mathem the informal mathematics, let's say. And on the right here is the formal mathematics, the one that um, can be automatically verified using some verification software. And the task of going from, from this informal to formal is not trivial at all. There is a lot of research going on there. But what I want to focus on is on the informal mathematics. So the language of mathematics itself. And this is what uh, uh, this talk is about. So I want to start talking a little bit about what properties of mathematical language are different from natural language. So what's special about this language of mathematics? First thing is that the domain of mathematics is very much self-contained. So if you want to talk about a concept in mathematics, either this concept ha has to be uh, defined. So either you have to define it or it has to be defined in the past. So for example, if you're gonna talk about X, you have to say, okay, what's X? X is an integer. So you have to be explicit about it. In natural language, we could say, oh, uh, I'm going to the cinema with John, but what is John? Is John a person? Is John a cat? Uh, what are you talking about? So you need to be very precise when you're talking about uh, concepts in mathematics. Mathematical terms also contain almost no vagueness. And I say almost because I have to struggle uh, parsing uh, mathematical text in some cases. So one uh, example is uh, when you have uh, expression in this in this format here. So you have a, a, a variable, a parentheses, and something inside the parentheses. Sometimes it could be just a multiplication, or it could be that you're applying a function. So in this case, it becomes very ambiguous, especially if you don't know the context. And, and one thing that is very interesting as well is that we have this combination of mathematical terms and words. So it's almost like uh, you have the, a dual modality. So you have uh, words intercalating with expression, with variables, and this is very unique from uh, mathematical language. And if you look at these symbols inside the text, they usually have very specific uh, functions. They, they, they are placed in certain contexts. So for example, if you look at uh, terms, uh, for example, variables and functions, they usually have the function of noun phrases. If you look at formulas or uh, expressions, equations, inequalities, they usually have the function of clauses. So for example, you could take a variable and uh, replace by, uh, let's say, Jake. You could say Jake here. And then you could take a, a, a formula and replace by, oh, John is shorter than Jake. And the, the, the syntax would still be bad, it still work. Another very unique aspect of the mathematical language is the use of variables. So variables in mathematical text, they act uh, in a similar way to variables in predicate calculus. So when you have a variable, in, you need to bound it to a certain uh, set. So you need to say, okay, this will take values from, from uh, the set of integers. And they are quite useful, especially when you have to talk about many entities. So imagine that we don't, do not have this concept of variables, right? Every time we talk about, uh, let's say, integers or reals, we have to be very explicit about. You have to say, take a value in the set of integers and take another value in the set of real, then this value added to that value. So by, by adding this, this idea of variables, you can make uh, the sentences become very concise. So you just say, let X be an integer, let Y be a real, then X plus Y, 
and then that problem is solved. So in essence, they serve as a mathematical alternative to anaphora. So you can just repeat the variable uh, as many times as you need to, to build your, your argument. About the structure of the text. So usually each sentence in the text is a logical consequence of the previous sentences. Uh, when you're building a proof, usually we start with a conjecture or with a statement. And then you, you start deriving other statements based on this initial one, and they all follow some sort of uh, a logical consequence. Even if you think about proofs by contradiction, uh, it still follows some logical consequence until it gets to the points where it says, okay, by contradiction, we show this. Also, mathematics makes minimal use of the rhetorical mechanisms that are available in natural language. So when you're reading a mathematical proof, you don't you don't have to worry about metaphors. You don't have to worry if uh, someone is being sarcastic or ironic. Um, I will be careful by saying this, but I don't think you have to worry about bias. I never seen an example of bias in, inside a mathematical text, but if someone has an example, I would very much like to see that. And I think the most beautiful thing about mathematics and the thing that I appreciate the most is the fact that once you prove a theorem, it becomes timeless. So once you prove something, it's solid because uh, it's so that once you, you've shown to the, the community that something is correct, that is sound, then it's really hard to break it. In order to break some things, you have to break the whole mathematics. And this is not found in many other science. So for example, in computer science, one year we say, okay, attention is all you need. And then the next year you go and say, uh, maybe attention is not all that you need. But if you take, uh, if a thousand years ago you had asked, uh, how do you compute A plus B square? It's still the same to this day. So there is uh, uh, something that about the permanence of mathematics that I really appreciate. Uh, if you, so uh, um, now, if you think about it in terms of um, the discourse, in terms of how it's uh, simple compared to a uh, natural language, we have less, uh, more regularity. One could think, okay, can I just uh, take this pre-trained language models and apply it to, to mathematical text? Because it's a bit more simple than natural language. Would that work? So let's see an example of a task that pre-trained language models are quite good. So natural language inference, for example, where you have a premise and you want to see if the premise entails a certain hypothesis, okay? And we know already that Roberta, which is the model I'm using here, is very good at this task. Let's start with a, a very simple example. So let's say we have the premise a plus B equals B plus A. It, uh, if you have basic uh, maths knowledge, you know that this entails that five plus one equals one plus five. And apparently Roberta does not agree with that. Uh, it thinks it's a contradiction, but you might say, okay, these models are not used to, to see mathematical uh, symbols. So let's give it some words, okay? So let's say we have as a premise, let A squared be a cube number, then A is a cube number. Let 64 be a cube number, then eight is a cube number. So this again is an entailment, but Roberta predicts a contradiction. And this is not me just cherry picking some examples to, to make Roberta break. You can try this with different variable names. You can try this with different uh, rephrasings. And it, most of the time it won't work. And past research has also shown that pre-trained language models, they struggle when trying to solve mathematical problems. So for example, uh, if you have a, a question and you give birth some alternatives of uh, possible answers to this question, what, uh, what they found is that the performance of birth will change depending on the, the order that you give the alternatives, uh, as you can see here. And this uh, implies that BERT, instead of trying to understand uh, 
what's going on here. It will first try to pick up some bias in the ordering of the, 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 the answers, the alternatives. So there is still no uh, ho um, holistic solution for numeracy in pre-trained language models. It, uh, everything depends on, on your task, depends on uh, how, which numbers are you using. So you're working with floats, are you working with uh, scientific notation, you're working with integers. So er, there's no, absolutely no standard. So this makes it quite hard to work with mathematical text. And in the end, they found that it just might be better to train your own model, right? Because since you cannot uh, really leverage the, uh, the, the, the power of pre-trained language models, which is a shame because uh, these are really good tools that we could potentially use. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about what I have been done so far to, to push the narrative a little bit. And I'll start by defining a task that I designed, which is defined, uh, is, which is a task of natural language premise selection, which is defined as given a set of premises or supporting facts P in a mathematical corpus containing both natural language and mathematical elements, and the new conjecture C proposed by a user, we want to predict those premises from P that will most likely be useful for generating a proof for C. So I released a data set last year in EURAC for this task. And just to show an example of how it would like, imagine you are a student and you're trying to prove the following statement. So the, the square root is the square root of two irrational. If we can design a system that will uh, suggest the square root of any prime number is irrational, then this can help uh, uh, this, this student find the proof for this proposition. And potentially we could do even something bigger. We could suggest theorems, we could suggest uh, mathematical knowledge that would help scientists make new scientific discovery if you have a, a knowledge base deep and large enough. So that is uh, uh, one of my long-term goals. Okay, so given what I mentioned about mathematical, mathematic, uh, mathematics being uh, very much, uh, we, we build blocks on top of each other. What we have done is we build a graph of dependencies between mathematical statements. So well, we create uh, different nodes representing different statements and the relationship between those nodes they became the, the dependency between those nodes. So for example, let's say uh, we have three different elements. So we have one theorem, another theorem, another definition. These are all nodes in our graph, okay? And this theorem requires certain uh, past knowledge. So certain theorems and certain definitions in order to be proven. So what we do is we connect the, this theorem and this definition to this other theorem that uh, we want to prove. And then uh, by, by predicting uh, uh, these links, we can, we can predict the usefulness of certain uh, theorems uh, for the proof. And that's what we, what we have designed. So we converted the problem of premise selection to the problem of link prediction, where we want to predict links between different statements, which translates as predicting, okay, can I use this statement to prove this other statement? So by designing the problem as a graph, we were able to uh, apply deep graph convolutional neural networks. And we found that by doing this, we obtained uh, really good results in comparison with pre-trained language models and fine-tuned uh, uh, language models uh, uh, such as BERT. And we, we get this, got these results published in ACL last year. So if you're interested, you can check out our paper. Another aspect of mathematical language that we, we leverage is the fact that we have these two different modalities. So we have words and we have expressions. So we had this hypothesis that since they look so different, maybe we should represent them using different embedding spaces. 
instead of just representing everything as one thing, words and expressions. So why don't we just split and say, okay, words should be represented in a certain way, uh, variables, expressions should be represented in a different way. We have done that by using different uh, self-attention layers. And as a matter of fact, we found that it actually works. The results in the premise selection task are much better than if we have just used one single way of representing this. And we also uh, published this work recently at the uh, ACL this year. There are also some other interesting tasks that other researchers have been exploring. So for example, we have uh, mathematical information retrieval, which aims to extend uh, information retrieval. So given a query, we want to predict the, the statements or expressions that are relevant for that query. Another interesting task is the math word problem. So basically given a question, we want to either predict uh, uh, the correct answer or we want to predict the, the correct alternative from uh, uh, possible uh, choices as uh, an example I showed before. So after working some time in this field, I have found three main challenges. So the first one is the incorporation of knowledge. So how do we incorporate mathematical knowledge into NLP models? Is it enough just to train these models with enough data? So for example, if I take BERT and if I train BERT with enough examples of addition, is it just gonna learn how addition works or do I need to explicitly define uh, of such rule and how do I define such rule? This is also a challenge. Another challenge is regarding representing symbols and numbers. So when you're representing words, you can take the embedding of the words, compare, compare the, the, the distance between these words and you have some kind of uh, metric for similarity. So how would that work for mathematics? So how do you say uh, an operation is so addition is more similar to subtraction than to multiplication. How, how would that work? So that's defining the similarity metric is quite challenging. And the last challenge is on the creation of data sets, because even though we have a lot of data available, uh, not, uh, we don't have that much uh, data annotated for that we could use for training, for example. And in order to annotate this data, we need expert knowledge. We need people who understand mathematics. So this, it's quite expensive to do, we, and we're still not able to scale it. So I think the takeaway, the main takeaway message of this talk is that there's still a lot of work to be done in NLP in order to understand mathematical text. There are some really great resources, uh, including this book that I, that I added here called The Language of Mathematics that really helped me out throughout my PhD. If you are interested in seeing a bit more about my research, you can follow me on Twitter where I try to, to post my, my recent work. And also I try to post about related work. So again, thank you very much for having me. Uh, and I'm open for questions now. Thank you very much, Deborah. That was wonderful. Everyone, please give her a round of applause. I see uh, many already. <laughs> yes, you can feel free to unmute as well and uh, give her uh, a round of applause. Um, so uh, we would like to invite you to ask some questions. We do have a, a few minutes here. Even though we're running a bit behind, it's fine because um, we can spill over into the networking and social uh, hours. So um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to either unmute yourself or post it in the chat. Um, and then we'll go from there, we'll ask the question. So it looks like we do have one uh, question already in the chat. It says here, do you think that in mathematics, assuming that everyone should know a particular uh, notation, say using V for a vector is a kind of bias, uh, somewhat similar to assuming that for everyone, the word, I'm not gonna say the word, <laughs> um, uh, N-I-G-G-E-R, I'll just spell it. Uh, should be offensive. Uh, there are some communities that use this term in a non-offensive way. Um, what are mm. your thoughts there? So I think, um, okay, <laughs> uh, so it makes sense to, to have this standard um, notation for certain areas. So for example, like, like you said, uh, usually you reserve, for example, C usually means a constant. So it's, it's a kind of bias, 
but not the type of bias I'm too worried about. And I think if we are able to model not only the variables, but also the context the variable is in, we can deal better with these variables regardless. Because if you, if you have like a, a, a physics paper, you're gonna know that something refers to, uh, let's say speed, or you know, if you have an A, it could be acceleration. Instead of you're using, if you're working on something else, you're gonna know it refers to a different type of, of set. So it's all about how we model the context that the element is in. Great, thank you. Okay, do we have any other questions for Deborah? I do have a question if there is time. Yeah, yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I go. yeah actually like uh, I have been working in a problem of like natural language generation. So let's say that I have a meaning representation with uh, numbers about COVID infections in a country. And I want to verbalize this into a text. Something that I see, it's like the neural networks really struggles to, to generate the right number, besides the, despite the fact that they generate a fluent text. So let's say that uh, in one day I had uh, 1,555 cases. Mm -hmm. In many cases, they, they put something like this. Okay, in this day, there was like 1,055 uh, cases. So it's a very close number but there is a mistake in one digit, but it counts for like 500 deaths or infections. So uh, I wonder if this is a problem of meaning. If I train more my neural network, it can actually learn to generate the digit, or is there something related to the alphabet? I would say, because I know that in uh, text synthesizer, uh, they represent numbers by the plain descriptions in English instead to represent by digits. Do you think if we do something similar to it, it may work? Maybe it's like a problem to understand the digits or, or, or no? I just would like your guesses. So what, what you're trying to do is to convert from digits to natural language or, or the opposite? No, the digits, it just need to copy the digits. But in many cases, you see that it copies similar digits, but there is like one in the middle that is not right. And then... I mean, okay, like a, like a language. Okay, okay, I understand. Yeah. Hmm. That's a really good point, really good question. Mm. I don't really have the answer because I never work with this, but I guess it's really hard to, to, do, to work with numbers without design explicit rules, right? So that's why I really like this this idea of having this hybrid neurosymbolic models because we can combine uh, the neural models with design rules. So maybe something towards that direction or maybe you can try just giving more training data. I'm not sure. I see. No, yeah, thanks. No, and, and it's interesting because it, it's easy, very easy to solve because actually you can also uh, generate a text with a dialectalized template instead of the number you put a placeholder there cases and then later you just replace by the number. But when you try to make the, the neural network learns, you see that it, it really struggles. So it, I, so I was one. I, I, if, do you, uh, what kind of model are you using? Just curiosity. I use BART, uh, T5, and uh, GPT-2. Okay, yeah. So they struggle a lot with numbers, I, I have seen. And I, I think it's just a matter of being exposed as well, right? Because there is not enough, uh, they don't see enough uh, numbers to, to understand what a number is, right? So that's is my guess. But there's there's a lot of research on, on numeracy and understanding numbers in pre-trained language models. So maybe something you could take a look at. I see. Well, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Do we have um, any other last minute questions? We can take one more, I think. Uh, hola. Uh, sorry. Hello. Uh, just one question. It's okay? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead, Juan. Uh, okay, uh, no, I wanted to know about the applications because you were talking about probably about education, about teaching, or some possible application is to, to
to use this for people to learn, no? to study mathematics, is what I understand. The per yes. some, some kind of personalized education. So what kind of systems are you thinking about in this direction? Uh, so for now, we're still uh, very much beginning the research. So we're still not at that stage to, let's say, design a product for education. But as a long-term goal, I would definitely want something that can give uh, like a, a personalized education, some kind of software that you can uh, install and then you can just have a chat and say what you're struggling with. And then it can give you some advice in terms of, okay, not give you exactly the answer to what you're trying to solve, but show you the way to get there. So that would be something I would very much be interested in. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you again, Deborah. Such a wonderful presentation and thank you for answering all the questions so far. Um, it looks like there may have been one more question in the chat. Maybe you can um, answer that directly in the chat or also uh, reserve it for when we all meet in the Gather Town space. Um, just before we uh, introduce our next speaker, I just want to remind everyone. Um, so we do have a, a survey that is available that we'll be sharing um, with uh, the group. I think it's already been posted in the chat once. Um, it just uh, allows us to get some feedback on the structure and uh, the organization of this particular event, also the keynotes uh, and how you enjoy it and if there's anything uh, we can do in the future to improve the process. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a moment after the event and filling that out, we would really appreciate your time uh, and go from there. So um, let's go ahead and introduce our next speaker. I think uh, Thiago might be introducing him. No, it's a pleasure to introduce Diego because more than like a very good researcher, he's a personal friend, so it's a pleasure. Uh, Diego is a, is a master in, has a master in computer science by the Military Institute of Engineering in, in Rio de Janeiro. He's from Rio in, in Brazil. Uh, he did his PhD, that was a summa cum laude in mathematics and computer science by the Paderborn University in Germany, where nowadays he's also an associate researcher. And nowadays he's also a senior natural language processing scientist in, in Global. It's the uh, largest uh, uh, media company in Brazil and in Latin America, I think. And uh, what is interesting about the research of Diego, it's like, because it's in this intersection among two very interesting fields, uh, natural language processing, but also in semantic web. So the presentation is entitled Knowledge Graphs for Multilingual Language Translation and Generation. So Diego, feel very welcome. Looking forward to, to your presentation. So hi everyone. So I, Tiago introduced myself, so I'll go straight to the, the topic. And so my presentation here, I'm going to to present the, the research that I carried out in my APATD. So it's knowledge graphs for multilingual language translation and generation. So the idea is to apply knowledge graphs in the whole pipeline of NLP. Um, so uh, I can start this presentation by telling you the, the definition of machine translation. So it's to transfer the semantics from a source language to a target language and most importantly, the source language can also be structured such as SQL, Sparkle, or even a spreadsheet, for example, can be a programming language as well. So here we have an example below. So it's in English, I want many persimmons. In Spanish, yo quiero muchos caquis. And in German, ich will viele persimone. So here you can see that we have transferred semantics from English to Spanish and German. And to create the foundation of this research, we have performed uh, a survey in the domain of machine translation, along with knowledge graphs. And we found out more than 37K papers and deep review, mainly more than 100. And we identified uh, some key machine translation challenges, which prevents the some improvements of the, the fluency and the adequacy of the natural language from one language to another. So the first is structural divergence. So for example, here, kanji, when you are translating from Portuguese to kanji in Japanese, Portuguese is subject, verb, and object, and kanji is subject, object, object, and verb. And also the second problem, the challenge here was linguistic properties, such as the irregular verb set, and but in English, when you are translating to Spanish or Italian, it has more than one uh, form, it depends on the verbal tense. 
and also semantic ambiguity, which uh, involves uh, polysemy and homonymous, homonym, homonymous. And, but here we found out that there is one common problem that affects directly and indirect all these challenges, which are related, which is entities. But what is an entity? Entity is a thing with an independent existence. So it can be a name and the entity, let's say the name of organization, person, or location, or, or also a concept. For example, home and cancer can be the, also an entity, but it's not a named entity. But here, for example, uh, let's see a problem in a translation. So we have in English, MS Paint is a good option, and then machine translation outputs to Frau Farbe's Deine Gute Wahl. So here you can see that uh, uh, Microsoft Paint, MS Paint was translated incorrectly. So we can, when we look at the reference translation in German is Microsoft to Paint is Deine Gute Wahl. So it happens because MS can be a Microsoft and also the treatment title of women. And also Paint can be an entity Paint, but also a verb and the surname of some families in German. And that our hypothesis lies in the use of multilingual knowledge graphs to improve the machine translation, but not only translation, but NLP in general. So uh, here we can see, for example, a subgraph of a Microsoft. So it has um, knowledge in three languages, English, German, and Portuguese. So for example, in the right side, we have a seat in English, Stadt in German, and Cidade in Portuguese, and also, for example, person, uh, person and pessoa in a, when referring to a human being. So the idea was to, to rely on multilingual knowledge graphs. And then it posed the following research question. Can knowledge graphs alleviate the ambiguity problem and be used to improve the quality of automatic text translation and generation? And in order to answer this question, we devised the following research challenges and by what I would say steps. The first is the multilingual entities ambiguation, which is the basically the first step to understand what an entity is, is in the text. So we recognize the type of the entity, but we need to disambiguate. The second challenge is, okay, once we recognize the entity, how to generate text out of this entity. And okay, once we know how to generate a text, let's translate this to another language. And the last challenge was basically uh, came out while you during the, the first three that, okay, once we plan to use multilingual knowledge graphs, let's um, re enrich the, the low resource knowledge graphs. So we are going to see these in the later. And so, okay, let's talk about the first challenge. So it uh, refers to the entity linking task. So basically the task is to is ambiguate to link a mention or a recognized entity to a refer uh, to a reference knowledge base. So here we have Angelina and her husband Brad having ever played together with her father John in a movie. So this is a, a text from the cinema domain, and we rely on Iago DBP, the Wikipedia, Wikidata, and Babelnet as a reference knowledge base. Of course, they are interconnected via same as um, predicate. But here, okay, Angelina and Brad, they are easy. They in the in the domain of cinema also because they were uh, married, but also uh, what's John? What's John here? So we rely. The goal is to disambiguate, for example, not only John but Brad and see if they have in common. And the motivation was the following: Okay, in, in English it performs pretty well, but let's see in another language and also um, multilingual approach. They claim to be multilingual, but they rely on English training data and they, and they use a cross-lingual dictionary to achieve the multilinguality. And this is prone to failure. So the idea was to investigate this problem. And then we created MAG for 40 languages. We started with seven, then we extended to 40 and they were, the paper, the, this uh, approach was published in KCAP 17 and ESWC 18. And here we can see the architecture of MAG. So in the left side, the components, I'll not delve too much into details, but feel free to, to read the paper later. So, but I keep, here I can give you the, the general goal. So we have the mentions like uh, entities, the candidates, 
uh, for the, the zombie creation. Then we have a candidate generation. So it applies for processing techniques and LPs, search by acronym. For example, in the tweet we have AJ can be Anthony Joshua or Angelina Jolie. Then we have search by label and search by STEM, applying STEM in technique, and then search by context. Remember the, the, the example of John. So we know that it's John, a father of Angelina Jolie because of the context, her father. And also, okay, after that, we generate a list of candidates and then we create a subgraph. After creating the subgraph, we expand the graph using BFS. And then once we expand it, we perform hits and page rank or each. And then we have the entity with a given score. So we evaluated the mag with F measure and we we could see that MAG achieves the state of the art in English and outperformed the state of the art approach on other languages. Okay, now let's talk about the second challenge. So now we know how to disambiguate, let's generate text. And here the, the task is the following. We have a subgraph, let's generate text from this graph. So we have Albert Einstein subgraph, and then we devised RDF to PT, originally created to Portuguese. We published this in Iraq. And then we extended these to Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, uh, French, German, and Dutch. And it's a rule and template based approach. And for example, here below, we can see the generated text. So we have Albert Einstein was a scientist who worked in physics. He was born in Ulm and graduated from the University of Zurich and so forth. So, okay, and then we evaluated our deaf GPT with 44 native speakers like Kurt Scale from 1 to 5 and performed statistical significance with Coxon with Bonferroni. And then the results showed that our deaf GPT achieves fluency close to human and adequacy as well. And then in the same challenge, okay, now that we generated text, but we are uh, looking into how if it, this entity is referred to more than once in the same text or in the same document, how can we improve the fluence? And then it goes into referring gener expression generation task. So let's see this example above. So Aarhus Airport is located in Aarhus, Denmark. Aarhus Airport is situated 25 meters above sea level. Aarhus Airport has a runway called 10R slash 28L. So here we can see in the above that Aarhus Airport is repeated more than once and it's not fluent at all. So how can we improve uh, the fluence of this text? And then here below the goal is this, the Aarhus Airport is located in Aarhus, Denmark. It is situated 25 meters above sea level and the airport has a runway called 10 r slash 28 l So to this end, we created NeuroReg and published into ACL 2018. There is a new version published recently by Tiago and Rosana, if I'm not mistaken. But here in this first version was a source, mood source encoder and decoder. So the idea was, okay, when we're generating the referring expression, important is what happened before and what happens after this entity. And then uh, how, how was the form that uh, used to refer the entity previously? And then here we have the, the vector of the entity, the context vector of the, what happened before this entity, and then the context vector that happens later after. So we, we devised the three strategies, sequence to sequence, uh, concatenative attention, and hierarchical attention. And so here the goal, we can see the output is, was it. Uh, we performed evaluation automatically and with the humans, the, with the automatic evaluation, we could see the concatenative attention was better than the other two approaches, and also the, the baseline. And the, with the humans, we performed this with 60 native speakers and performed the statistical significance, the same as we did in rjf 2 pt And as well, the concatenative attention was better than the other approaches. Okay, now that we know how to disambiguate, how to generate text, let's to see how we translate, how we can alleviate the problem of translation. And we devised KGNMT, um, the first approach that uses knowledge graphs in neuro machine translation. And then we performed two strategies. The first using entity linking, remember MAG in the first challenge, but not only MAG, if you devised uh, a new entity linking, you can just plug in here. 
uh, plus knowledge graph embeddings. And the second strategy with, uh, without entity linking, because entity linking is costly. It, it actually takes time to annotate, for example, 4 million um, sentences. So here's the architecture. We have in the left side, a knowledge graph. It, uh, it, use, it is used in the image recognition and linking here below. Let's say here is Mag with a Fox or, or Spacey, you'd, you'd cite. And then it's used to annotate the bilingual corpora. The same knowledge graph is converted to knowledge graph embeddings, and then it's concatenated to the embedding layer of the neural architecture. So here's the generic neural architecture because you can simply use a BLSTM transformer. It's, it's up to your choice. And we evaluated KGNMET um, in the English German translation task at WMT, and then it achieves consistent improvements plus three blur meter and CHRF. But uh, here in this, without entity linking performed better than the entity linking approach, simply because uh, we perceived that in the domain, some, uh, some domain specific sentences the entity link didn't perform pretty well, so it affects the translation. But also it improved over the baseline, even the first uh, strategy. Okay, but we also interested, main, mainly interested in the, in the entities. They were translated correctly, so yes. So KGNMT decreased the number of the entities translated incorrectly. So you can see that it decreased more than uh, 2000 entities. So. In translated correctly, some uh, much more entity, many more. And um, okay, then we devised that. Okay, we addressed the first challenge, the second challenge, the third challenge. But the main challenge was also how. Okay, if you look at the the diversity of the knowledge graphs, I'm talking about Wiki uh, Wikidata, Babelnet, um, Iago, all of them. English is the the largest one. So how can we alleviate this problem? So for example, you can see that Portuguese is much smaller than in English and also Catalan and Galicia and the others. So how can we improve uh, and alleviate this problem? So to this end, we devised the Tohut, was published in ISWC 2018, uh, 19, sorry. So let's think the following here. That's the, the, the architecture. So we have in the training a source KB and a target KB. So source KB, English, target KB, Spanish, German, Portuguese, Italian, up to our, up to our choice. And then, okay, we extract the bilingual content. Okay, they have the bilingual content. They have same as connections. So we extract this bilingual knowledge and then we train a triple based neural model. And in order to augment these, we also can, uh, rely on bilingual generic corpora. So for example, I don't know, we can use parallel crawl or machine translation, or workshop of machine translation uh, training data. It's up to us, can also use Wikipedia text. And then we trained uh, this neural model. And then translation phase is the following. Okay, we have the source KB, the English KB, we sent this to our model and then it generated the enriched target KB. And here, uh, the goal is to enrich, not to translate completely. So if it, a given um, domain or a given knowledge exists in the, the, in the target KB, we maintain the knowledge of the target KB. So it is just an enrichment. And then, okay, let's evaluate this enrichment in three tasks. The first was translation task to see if it, okay, it's performing correctly because we are combining triples with, uh, with text. And then we get, the, remember the bilingual knowledge that we extracted, we divided this in training that and test following the machine learning uh, practice. And we achieved 88 to 56%. So the accuracy was, High and then, but, but okay. Let, let's look at the the this bar chart. Okay, subjects were translated correctly, predicates, objects pretty well. And but while you're looking at the triples, we could see that okay, what what happened here? So if they were if each looking at separately, they were translated correctly. So looking here, we could see that some were uh, problems of the predicates. For example, domain of music 
artist and a singer, the, the neuro model translated incorrectly. But also what's fascinating, then I, I invited you to read the Hood, was that the translation was able to disambiguate the entity. So assigning a disambiguated uh, URI, even creating a new one. So that was fascinating. And the second uh, task was fact validation to see if a given fact is correct. I don't know, uh, Albert Einstein was a, a physicist, uh, Barack Obama was uh, the president of the United States. And then using uh, Tohut, we could see that it uh, improved plus 18% with the new facts. So our was there was nothing before and then it improved 28%. So well, the same happens with birthplace. Birthplace and death place was less because it's a, a common thing in, in knowledge bases, but leader improved substantially. The, the last task, uh, task here was the entity linking. Remember Meg in the first challenge? So, okay, if you are translating, if you are, sorry, disambiguating German texts or Spanish or, or Portuguese, so Tohut, because Meg relies on a knowledge graph. So if we enrich the knowledge graph used by Meg, so we, it will improve, well, we, let's see. So here we relied on the following data sets. So the first two German, the, the, the both in the bottom and Spanish and German, if I'm not mistaken. And then we have the original and then the with the Tohut, with the enriched KB. And then we could see that it improved substantially, but we were skeptical. Okay, it's almost one F measure. So let's see what happens here. So we could see that the German, these data sets, the German abstracts and in three, they were created based on the English Wikipedia. So therefore, when we uh, enriched the German, um, knowledge, the, the German knowledge base with the English content, Okay, then we were able to disambiguate most of the entities. But then in the, in the both in the bottom, we could see that um, they were created only in the over German and Spanish text, but still we improved the entity linking task here. So as a summary, we addressed four research challenges. We published 25 papers pertaining to this research, six as a core, and 19 as a related research, basically data sets, systems, or, or further investigation. So here is the research workflow. So we, remember, we have the English source, MS Paint is a good option. We use MAG, great Microsoft Paint, the entity in the BBP. Do. Then we perform NeuroReg plus RGF2PT to get the, the text and referring expressions from this entity. Okay, also we, now we have to translate. And then we realized, okay, in the German DVP, there is no uh, Microsoft Paint, only Paint. So let's enrich this with the hood. Once we enrich it, we could generate labels to the German DVP. And then it was translated correctly. Microsoft Paint designed a good value. That's all. Thank you. These are my emails, uh, the, the web, website. Follow us on Twitter, Global and Dice Research. And also, if you want the code of all these approaches, you can look at the GitHub of DICE. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. I hope I Thank was able you, to, to present in a manner way so many content. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, looks like we've got a, a bunch of claps already in the um, chat thread. And uh, that's really wonderful presentation, super in-depth. Um, so let's go ahead and open up uh, the chat for questions. Also, feel free to unmute yourself if you have particular questions for Diego, um, or if you prefer to put it in the chat, I will go ahead and read it off uh, for the group. I have a comment more than, than a question, like something that you mentioned about, I mean, like this is a open issue, right? Like the, and you know, like in, in terms of entities, I can expect, and sometimes it depends on the language. Like for example, in my lab, um, uh, there's one student that is specifically working with that in, in Japanese. So I am in Japan, so that's why they're working in Japanese. So he's trying to, so the example that he used. Um, so it with entities, for example, the Yahoo forum in Japanese is called a Yahoo Chiebukuro. So if you translate Chiebukuro, so it translates, it has the word for like bag, 
for which is of course not what it means. So of course, like then it is automatically translated from Japanese to English and is translate is literally translating the entity, but it, it shouldn't be doing so. It's probably the correct translation is something like uh, a Yahoo form or something like that. So I think like his approach is trying to use uh he's using Wikidata and like defining some templates. And he's just like that is his like master thesis project. I think he like so far he like gained a little bit of improvement in one of the Japanese to English models, but he's still like struggling with that with it because like entities. Yeah, I would, like I will be happy to connect with him. Yeah. We faced this problem because we devised one um, part of Mag for Japanese. And then we uh, the, the, the word she can be a warrior, a teacher, can be many, many kinds of concepts. And then we were translating the translation. I actually saw, wow. So there are more than 20 translations in Japanese from Japan to from Japanese yeah. to English and, and vice versa. Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, Japanese is a very interesting language in terms of, of entities. So I, I'll, be, I'll be happy to connect you with him if you want to. Like, I think like also he could benefit a lot from this presentation. So oh, that would be nice. Uh, Thank you, Diana. Okay, and looks like um, Tiago Torrent has his hand up. Would you like to ask your question? Hi. Uh, so thank you, Diego, for the great talk. I actually have uh, one question that is less related to named entities and more related to entities in general. And I think it somehow relates to Diana's question in uh, uh, she just asked. So how would you deal with what I tend to, to, to think of as the embedded, in air quotes, uh, ontolex interface problem with uh, KGs? So for example, when you, you provided the example with city, uh, cidade, and right, so on and, and, and so forth, I remember that uh, once we were dealing with uh, suborganizations of political locales. So when you think of city, town, village, and uh, yeah. depending on the language, this can uh, actually not find a parallel translation. So I remember one uh, uh, interesting glitch with the Google KG in which when, when you searched for a village and in Brazil, it would show you uh, Native American or Native Brazilian Ocas and uh, Aldeias, but see, you, you, yeah. you know, you wouldn't call them villas in Portuguese, which would be like the kind of translation, right? So uh, my, my question is, is, is very broadly and I don't need a specific answer, but my impression is that uh, KGs, because they are some, somehow ontology oriented or ontology based, um, they may let aside some nuances or differences in perspective that lexical items uh, include naturally, right? So yeah, sure. uh, how, do, how do you see this issue and how do you, do you envision a solution for it or something like that? So yeah, there are some knowledge graphs that they are based uh, I mean, own ontologies, they have a, an ontology behind, for example, the Wikipedia, but for example, Wikidata, they have an inherited um, ontology, but actually no ontology. So what I have been researching is to work on layers. So for example, the first layer would be to rely on semantic annotation, which would be different from entity linking, but we don't have too many tools for this. So I, I saw one presentation, if I'm not mistaken, yesterday in the ESWC of named entities and non-named entities. So it would be in this sense of uh, you relying on ontology. And one research that I have been carrying out is to have a combining graph, uh, graph attention neural network rely on ontology. So the input, think of the, in the input, the, the first, uh, the, the, the input of the graph would be the ontology itself, but based on a graph can be, I don't know, uh, in a triple, in a, in a any triple, whatever. But below would be the representation, would be, sorry, it would be the text which represents this graph, this ontology. But 
uh, and then in the in the as a in the, in order to augment, we are working on a quartanion and octonion knowledge graph embeddings, which give us more freedom to to map the concept to both both encoders. So that's uh, what I have been looking. But I, I feel that not, not feel it's a sure we don't have many semantic annotation tools which would improve also this concept, not only entity translation. I have seen Fred. There is a tool named Fred to, that it performs semantic annotation, but I guess it, it's they didn't continue with this. So the way it would be ontology and try to generalize the ontology within the language model, and it's a uh, it's uh, difficult. <laughs> I would say, yeah, that's our my, my two cents. Thank you, Diego. Looks like uh, Tiago is satisfied with your answer. Um, okay, do we have an, another question or two um, before we move over to the Gather Town space? Okay, that might so be all no, the questions no. for now then. Oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, no, I would say just because I, I couldn't put in the in the presentation, but uh, there is a, a new paper that we published. Uh, it's named NABU. It's a multilingual as well, using graph attention neural networks to generate Russian, German, and English. So yeah, I suggest you also reading this paper. It's nice. Uh, I couldn't include it here. It's too short. <laughs> yeah, that, that's it. Thank you very much, Diego. Um, obviously, you have a breadth of knowledge in this area, and I'm sure uh, so much to share going forward into a longer presentation. So everyone, please give him a big round of applause again uh, for taking the time out to uh, share his knowledge and experience with us. Thank you.